Hallelujah.
mountains are still being moved, and strongholds are still being loose. God, we believe, and yes, we can see that wonders are still what you do. Come on, bodies, and bodies are still being raised, and giants are still being slain. we can see that wonders are still what you do we are here for you come and do what you do we are here for you come and do what you do set our hearts set our
We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you. Well, our God is so gracious and good. I, I feel impressed to read, uh, this is not my message, but I feel impressed this morning to read to you from the book of Acts some scripture that I think will help us because we live in peerless, dangerous, and difficult times. It says in, in uh, Acts 27 and 20, When neither sun nor stars in many obeyed appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, and all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Now, I want you to understand that they were in a hopeless situation. Many times in life we find ourselves facing hopeless situations. But the Apostle Paul says, Be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me, this is important, this night the angel of God, whose I am, and who I serve. Amen. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we serve the living God. And so things may look dark at times. We wonder how we're going to make it through. Our God, His grace is sufficient to lead us through. Amen. That, that God will govern everything about our life. That it is our individual relationship with God and our emphasis on the Word of God in our personal life that makes all the difference in the world. Because God is able to show his divine favor to us. Uh, because we have a mission. We're called by God to carry this gospel into the four corners of the earth. And we do that in another way. We do that by, by declaring Jesus Christ in our daily life with the people that we experience at work. We do it by, by sending Bibles as we did uh, this month. Sending Bibles to places that we'll never go. How that people might have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do it by sending missionaries around the world to places that many of us would not want to go, but we see that the gospel goes forth because this gospel, this word that we preach is so important. And we're living in the last days. We're living in a day and time when, when the devil will try to discourage us on every hand. There's so many things being done against the body of Christ today in this nation that we thought would never happen. But in spite of all those things, God's grace is sufficient. That's what he says in the Word. His grace is sufficient for us, and God will cause all these things, and we pray them through in the Spirit, that he'll cause all things to work together for good. I want to thank the praise team. Y'all did a wonderful, wonderful job this morning. Thank you for using your gift and talents to the Lord. And you may be seated this morning. You know, we're, we're a little thin this morning. That's because all the children, all the youth are over in Whoville. And if you smell the aroma of bacon, I don't see anybody slip out and go over next door. You're, you're too old. You didn't bring your pajamas, so, so you can't visit Whoville. But I want to give you a word from the Lord this morning. You know, I believe that, that God gives us a word for a specific time. And over the course of the last several weeks, we, we have talked about Grace, the grace of God, which could be interpreted the favor of God, that, that God's divine favor is upon us as an individual believer. Certainly it's on the whole body of Christ, but as an individual believer, God's grace is upon our life. In every place we go, the grace of God covers us. Uh, God uh, protects us and he keeps us, and he causes us to prosper in the thing we set our hand to. And so it's just important. Then, then we talked about that no word of God will fail. Anything that God has said, uh, you know, when God says things, you know, the Bible says that God cannot lie. And the reason he can't lie is because when God says something, it sets in motion uh, every element to bring that word to pass. So, so God is truth, and everything he says about us is true. Now, sometimes it doesn't look that way. Sometimes it doesn't feel that way. But nevertheless, the word of God is truth. And, uh, you know, then last week we talked about having faith in God. You know, it is our, our personal faith in God and the promises of God, God's love and care that is so important to us. But, but today we're going to talk about uh, the, the battle between good and evil. Amen. There's a battle that's raging today in the world. And, uh, you know, it could be that uh, we could be discouraged by the things that we see as we get into this message today. You know, there are things that would just cause us to throw up our hands and quit and say, Lord, come get us. We, we're tired of the battle. But you know, uh, the, the, the battle belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of life's journey, 
is victory. Oh, if you have your Bible, you turn to Romans, the fifth chapter. I'll read ver two verses of scriptures there. It says this, But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we're so thankful today for, for you know, the presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for this opportunity that we have, Lord God, to, to look to your word. We thank you today that the Holy Spirit will feed, feed us from your word, Lord God, that you, you will take the words that we speak and cause them to be engrafted in our life, Lord God, that we'll take courage. And Lord God, that we'll take the strength and the energy and realize the Lord now as never before, that we need to rise up with the strength of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, to be about your business for soon and very soon, Lord, the night's coming and the Word says no man can work in the dark. So, Lord, we thank you for that we have a day and while it's day, we will work for you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, our text that we, we refer to this morning, it, it talks about the simultaneous operation of, of darkness and, and, and the grace of God. There are opposing forces and we see that. You know, the things that have happened in our country... Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of things that have happened since March, actually since the latter part of April, that have happened in our nation that some of us thought would never happen. You know, they, they have had cases before the Supreme Court because uh, the, the constitutional, right, constitutional right that people have to assemble and worship God ha has been impugned uh, in some states. And so, so we live in, in very difficult and dangerous times, and, and the real struggle is between good and evil. That, that evil is uh, certainly trying to take over uh, this country and rule this country because we're, we're the, probably the last, not the only nation, but we're the nation that sends out more Bibles, more missionaries th than any other nation on earth. And it's important that we continue to do that until the, the trumpet sounds. So, so it is important that we understand what this verse says, that there is a battle between good and evil. It's always existed, but it's been accelerated in these last days. Now, Paul says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now, the word abounded here that we find in this text, uh, he, he describes the growth of sin. And that word abound simply means uh, more. There's more of it. And, and so sin is growing we could say uh, it's growing by leaps and bounds. It's sin is everywhere. It's growing larger and more expansive all the time. Uh, with every, every passing day, uh, sin continues to abound. Uh, it, it implies to us that sin is never stagnant, never stands still. You know, God doesn't stand still. Well, you know, the kingdom of darkness doesn't stand still either, and it's working. Its objective is to take over the whole world. The objective of God is that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will control the world. And God has said eventually that will happen. Where sin exists in abundance, it's multiplying, and it's constantly expanding, uh, it describes the growth nature of sin. You know, we, I saw this on, on uh, you, uh, Facebook, and I thought this was good. We're a society that accepts pornography, but we hate abuse. We don't believe or we are confused about gender, but we fight for the rights of women. We believe that no child should be left behind, but we have aborted almost 50 million babies. We have on our, our, on our money, in God we trust. It's on our corners. Now, people have tried to remove that, but it's still there. In God we trust. But we also realize that the ACLU will sue anybody that tries to put it in the public domain. You can't put it on any kind of, uh, of government uh, building or government uh, policy. They, they use the phrase that I believe Thomas Jefferson said uh, in writing, the separation between church and state. Now, if you, if you research the history, you'll find out that in the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C., when Thomas Jefferson was the president, that they held church in the House of Representatives. So that wasn't what he was talking about. He wasn't talking about the exclusion uh, of, of religion from, from the uh, public view, but that's what is, has been taken to mean and has been used many times to stop the furtherance of the gospel. Now, as we said, our, faces, our nation faces an abundance of crisis. And there are a number of, we're going to talk about for just a brief moment, Number one is drug addiction. You know, 
drug addiction is, is rampant in our country, as well as crime. 21% of all crimes in America are drug-related. In uh, the year 2018, 31,000 people died of fentanyl overdose. Not everybody uses fentanyl, but those that died from overdose. And that's just one of the many opioids that are available to people uh, that, that people take. They're, they're addicted to these things. And then there's a problem of uh, pornography and its addiction. You know that there are 400, I had to look these up, there are 400,000 pornographic sites on, 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 the, on the World Wide Web. And uh, of these, there's an estimated 450 million hits on those websites every month. That's a problem. You know, I, I, I was in a meeting Monday with uh, one of the leaders of the Teen Challenge, and he was talking about drug addiction. Drug addiction is a terrible uh, problem in society, but he said the worst addiction is pornography. There, there are more and more people that are, are uh, uh, addicted by pornography. Women today, you know, you would think it just uh, applies to men, but women today are being addicted to pornography. And then, uh, you know, when you talk about pornography, you talk about there's 116,000, 116,000 searches every day for child pornography. That, that's how debased our society has become. 40% of all pornography, it depicts violence toward women. And uh, the internet porn business is a $3 billion a year business. Our nation has a problem with pornography. And then we talk about abortion. Uh, in, in the year uh, 2017 through 2018, Planned Parenthood, through its affiliates, recorded the highest number of abortions in a single year. 345,672 babies that were aborted in one year. Since 1973, there have been over 50 million babies, children, that have been aborted since they made you know, abortion a, a legal part of our law, and, our, and that's just in our nation. All over the world, uh, it, it is happening. And so it is, these are just a problem. We could go in, we could list things that are wrong, that are wrong with our society all day long. Uh, but, you know, as we look at these statistics and you, you look at the, the, the growing rampage of sin, you know, we could, be, we could be defeated. So, well, what's the use? Just throw up our hands. Lord, come quickly. Uh, it's over with uh, because it seems so, so overwhelming. But I, I, I'm glad that the Word of God gives us some, uh, it gives us some help. There are some laws of God that apply. Number one is the laws found in Galatians 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 7. It says, Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That, that is a universal law. You know, our society has sown awful seeds, and uh, seeds that are destructive. And, and I want you to know there's a harvest coming. There's a day when the seeds that people have sown are going uh, to, to come home to them. And it's a horrible thing to think that people not only going to reap a harvest of destruction in this life, but there's an eternity that they'll spend in, 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 a, in a, 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 a separation from God that's so horrible to imagine that you wouldn't wish it on anybody. But that's the harvest that is going to come to them. See, the world needs the message of Jesus Christ more than it has ever needed the message of Jesus. People need to know that Jesus came to forgive them of their sins. You know, people say there's a sin problem. No, there's not a sin problem. 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, and he shed his blood to take care of the problem of sin. He paid for the sin past, present, and future. The problem is, and, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes to convict men of sin, and the sin he comes to convict them in uh, is they do not receive the love gift of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in the Lord. They don't believe in his ability to forgive them. So we live in a day and a time when, when the law of sowing and reaping is, is challenged by those. You know, people say, well, that's not so. You know, you, you just live whatever life you want to and uh, enjoy, you know, grab for all the pleasure in life you can because life is short. Well, life is short, but there's a harvest day that's coming. People scoff at the fact that God would uh, reward uh, sinful people. Well, he will. 
Because whatever crop, you know, in the natural, if you grow corn, don't expect watermelons because you're going to reap corn. The sow, the seed you sow determines the harvest you're going to have. And there's a lot of people that need to pray for a crop failure. You know, uh, God's law of sowing and reaping is just as, as real as a law of gravity. You know, if you get up on this building and jump off, you're going to fall. You're going to come crashing to the earth because that's the law of gravity and it works every time. The law of sowing and reaping works every time. It's just that sometimes it takes a while to receive a harvest. Paul boldly declares, whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That word soweth refers to any seed that's sown. It doesn't matter what you sow. The emphasis is on the seed that is sown. As I said, the type of seed you sow is going to determine the harvest you, you receive. You know, if you sow love, guess what? You're going to reap a harvest of love. If you, if you sow time into other people, you're going to receive time. You know, I, I, many years ago, I heard a lady that went to Oral Roberts, and she said, Brother Roberts, she was going to argue. She said, I just don't have enough time. I just, I, I, I'm pushed from pillar to post. I don't have time. I'm trying to do my work and, uh, you know, my school work, and I just don't have enough time. He said, well, how much time are you giving to God? And she said, for a minute, and she said, well, none. He said, if you'll give God some time, you'll be surprised that God will help you to gain time. Well, what she did was she began to give time to God, and she realized some things are not as important as other things, and she began to organize her life around God and about uh, the things of God. And guess what? It wasn't long before she was able not only to spend time with God, but she was able to organize her schoolwork. And there's probably some things she left off, but they're not all that important. You know, there's a lot of things that we do in life. In the scheme of things, that's just not really all that important. You know, if you sow bitterness, guess what? You're going to reap bitterness. If you sow selfishness, then, then people will, will you, you're going to harvest selfishness. You know, the Bible bears that out. I believe it was Jacob that went down and, you know, he tried, he was a supplanter and, and he had uh, stolen the birthright or he had uh, supplanted or uh, laid out a scheme. He stole the birthright. His mama helped him and, and he ran for his life because he figured out when his brother found out, his brother would kill him. And so he lives with his uncle, who's a bigger con man than he is. Because if you sow selfishness, if whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Guess what? He was reaping a harvest. For years, he reaped a harvest because he wasn't smart enough on his own to overcome. But God said, I'm going to help you out of your dilemma. You know, it's when God comes on the scene that he helps people out of the dilemma. You know, we, we've had the men and women from Teen Challenge. They couldn't do it on their own, but God gave them the help necessary to overcome. And so Paul lets us know that the law of God... It applies to every part of our life. There's not a part of your life that, that, that it doesn't apply to. You know, your husband or wife, if you show love to them, if you, if you do what is required as a husband or wife to show love to your, to your spouse, guess what? They're going to love you back. They're, they're going to reciprocate to you what you've given. You know, as a church body, and I'm so, I, I'm so pleased with, with this body of believers that, that we sowed Bibles over $2,000 worth of Bibles. I think, you know, you ought to give yourself a hand clap. That, that's wonderful. There, there's 2,000 Bibles, or that's going to buy Bibles is going to the hands of people that don't even have a Bible. You know, Bibles are everywhere. I have uh, dozens of Bibles all around the church and, and at home, Bibles everywhere. But, you know, but they're in the English language. Well, how many of you know that people, they don't, they don't understand English all over the world? We think they ought to, but, you know, you know, if you've ever called and they say, if you'd like this message in, in English, press one. For Spanish, press two. Well, I don't speak Spanish. I've been, I've been uh, tempted a few times, just press two, see what it sounds like. <laughs> you know, just to see what it sounds like in Spanish, because I don't speak Spanish. Well, you know, those people in Sri Lanka, they, I don't know what language they speak, but it's not English. We have missionaries in Africa. Uh, and they, they, they speak French because French in, in parts of Africa is kind of a universal language. Everybody understands a little French. And so they go to French school to learn to speak French. They don't speak English. They speak French because the people in Africa, many of them, understand a little bit of French. There are so many tongues and dialects. You know, in, the, in Mexico, there are di nine different languages. I didn't know that. I thought everybody in Mexico spoke Spanish, but they don't. You know, there's Spanish, there's Portuguese, there's French, 
And then the Indians all have a language. There are several tribes of Indians. They all speak their own language. So everybody in Mexico doesn't speak Spanish. Amazing. You know, you think everybody speaks that same language. There was a gentleman that his wife was Hispanic uh, descent, and they went down to Mexico, and she said, no problem, I speak Spanish. She got down there. She spoke Tex-Mex. And uh, they spoke a different, uh, you know, Spanish. And she had a hard time communicating with them because they didn't understand what she was talking about. There was, a, there was a language barrier. You know, thank God that we have bridged the language barrier because we're sending Bibles. And that's not the first time. We sent to our military a little Bible stick, a little, little instrument with a little, little uh, uh, AAA battery, that earplugs. They go in combat. And while they're resting, they can hear... Uh, you know, the Psalms, and they can hear the New Testament, and it's an encouragement to, to them. My, my brother, uh, he went on into glory, but he was a, he was a combat uh, officer in Vietnam. He said, there are no atheists in Foxhole. When the bullets start flying, people call out to God because nobody wants to die without God. So God has helped us produce the harvest. You know, we sent missionaries. There's missionaries all over the world that we support. You have a harvest that's coming. Some of it is immediate. You know, sometimes we hear the good word uh, of those that have received the harvest. I want to quickly read to you. I won't take a lot of time. I'm mindful of the time here this morning. But uh, it was that, uh, well, I don't have it here. Our missionaries uh, in Africa, Jamie and Leah Peters, they went back into Rwanda. If you remember, Rwanda was uh, uh, in, in the midst of civil war. And they had a church of about 2,000, 1,500 people, and it got down to about 100 because people were scattering everywhere. And the, the people uh, of the church said, when are you leaving? Because the Red Cross, the French Red Cross had already left. He said, I'm not leaving until God says leave, and he hadn't told me. So they went back. To, to revitalize that church. The other day, uh, they sent a letter. They had 1,036 people that had first time accepted Jesus Christ as Lord. You have a part of it because we have been supporting those missionaries for years. When you get to heaven, there's going to be people that come to you and say, because you gave, I'm in heaven today. That's the difference. The power of God. The word of God. There are people in these countries that they're going to hear the gospel through the Bibles that's been sent from the people of Louisiana and they're going to say, I'm here because you sent the word of God. You know, there, there used to be an old song we say, send the light, send the light, send the gospel light. Well, you know, that's an most important thing we can do today is send the word of God to the far reaches of the earth. Now, Paul goes on to uh, you know, he just doesn't stop with the problem of sin. I'm glad he doesn't stop that. He said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Much more. The grace of God. Oh, you can't fathom the grace of God. Uh, that, that, that God's grace grows beyond measure. Uh, it's beyond proportion. It's out of its banks. It's stretched to extreme. It's like a river that has so much water it just overflows its banks. Now, we all know about that. A few years ago, down, you know, uh, across, I think it's Wimple Road there, all those elaborate homes that built on the wrong side of the levee. And, uh, you know, the, the Corps of Engineers said, well, flooding is a hundred year uh, happening, and, you know, it's not going to happen anytime soon. They didn't no more get the words out of their mouth. Here comes the flood. And it flooded those homes. And it ruined some of them because of the water. They had to do repairs. So we know all about flood waters. My, my, uh, my wife's grandfather uh, had a daughter who lived up north. I think uh, the river had overflowed, flooded their house, had a two-story house. I had flooded sometimes six foot of water, six to eight foot of water in the bottom floor. Filled it up. And uh, she had been flooded out two or three times. You know, that might make you want to move. Well, you know, you never escape the glory of God's river. The river of God's grace and mercy is flowing, amen? And it, it overflows its banks. Now, this, this property that we're on, years and years ago, the river, the river used to overflow where the road is. In fact, in the front of this, uh, of this uh, property, there's sandy soil. Many years ago, when we had an engineer do his survey... Up front, right about here, is sandy soil, but you get a few feet back, and it's nothing but clay. And it's because the river used to overflow with sediment, 
uh, years and years ago, way back in the 1800s, and uh, there weren't any roads, and then it flood in here, and it left its deposit. I want you to know when the river of God flows, it leaves the residue. It leaves the power of the Holy Spirit that changes lives. Uh, years ago, we had a, a gentleman come uh, the first year I was pastoring in the old church. Had a man from, from uh, uh, the Gideons that came. And a wonderful, I mean, this guy was a tremendous storyteller. And he told the story of a man that was in, in, in uh, uh, he was in confinement. In fact, he, he was in isolation in the prison. Uh, he was a bad man. And, uh, you know, he's in darkness. And he said, you know, his eyes were just like, give me something to read. And the guard thought it'd be funny. He threw a New Testament in there. Read that. He thought he was being a punishment. And after a while, the guy picked it up because he's there and he doesn't have anything to entertain himself. He's just the four walls in darkness and he begins to read the Word of God. Guess what? The Word of God changed his life. He got saved. He got saved by reading the Word of God. You know, the Word of God has the power, amen? The, 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 the Word contains the power of God. And when you read the Word of God, you can have the manifestation of the Word of God in your own life. Jesus said, I'm the Lord that heals you. That's what God said. Well, you know what? If it's in the book, it applies to you as a child of God. If the Bible says you were healed, then you are healed. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says with his stripes you were healed. Romans 5.21, we could read it this way. Whenever sin exists in abundance, it's multiplying, constantly expanding. That's the precise time. Right then is the time and the place where the grace of God is poured out in a greater overcoming capacity. You know, this, this Bible, they've tried to get rid of this book for years. You know, during the Nazi regime, they burned a lot of books, but boy, these were, these were the head of the line. You burn that Bible. Yeah, and a lot of the Muslim country, you cannot have a Bible. I had a brother that worked in Saudi Arabia. And uh, he worked in a 35, he lived in a 35-mile compound. They said, you can bring your Bible in, but you keep it at your house. We don't want any people reading the Bible. That book, somebody had a, a book, a Bible cover, said it's banned in 53 nations. Why? Because there's power in this book. You know, they, they don't... They don't ban Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, but the Bible has the power to produce the results of God if it's believed. If thou canst believe. If you believe the Word of God, guess what? The power of God will come jumping out of the page regardless of what language it's in, and it will produce the results of God. It is designed to produce results. This book is a powerful book that produces results wherever it's believed. Regardless of where we live, where we live in America, Land of the free and home of the brave. Well, it used to be. We're facing things today like we've never faced before. Now, I'm not saying that, that this uh, disease is not deadly. It is. But, you know, there are people that have taken advantage of a bad situation to impose their will upon others. Because, you know, thank God, the grace of God's still flowing, and it flows downstream. It flows to us. You know, you can be in your car going to work, singing to the glory of God. The power of God can meet you in that car. A well-known uh, minister years before he was in the ministry. I was a multimillionaire. He said, I used to go to my local church and tip God $200 every month whether he needed it or not. But he said, one day I'm riding in my Cadillac and I'm going down the road and God got in the car with me. And his life was forever changed. Why? Because the power of God changes our life. You know, here's what the Word says. It teaches us that God's grace is sufficient for any need we have. Isaiah 59 and 19 says this, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in. Well, you know, the enemy is always trying to get into your life. You know, he has people. People are addicted to, to all these things. He already has them. It's you. He's trying to get you to let go of the Word of God. That's the reason we need to have a strong grip on the Word of God. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, I don't like where they put the comma because the devil is not a flood. He tries to be, but God is a greater flood. Like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. The, the, the Word of God, the Spirit of God is the standard. You know, the Bible says it's just not a lot of grace. It's more and more and more and more expansive grace, the power of God. 
You know, the Bible says Jesus had all the Holy Spirit there was to, to possess. And we're given a portion of that. We receive a portion of the Holy Spirit. When we receive the Holy Spirit, when you're born again, then you receive the Holy Spirit as a, a further work of grace, you get a portion. Now, that's the reason you get a meeting where you get a lot of believers together. You have manifestations of things that you don't have sometimes with just a few. Why? Because you have a greater manifestation of the Holy Spirit in, in operation. But that same Spirit, you know, if, if we were to have all the Holy Spirit poured out on us, I don't think we could stand up. Sometimes people fall under the power of God because the power of God, the glory of God is so great. You know, time and again, when people witness angels, they didn't even witness the Lord. They're just an angel that came from God. They, they fell and, and began to worship. They said, oh, don't worship me. I'm just an angel. I'm a fellow servant like you. We worship God. But the power of God was so present and so strong that they could not stand. The Bible says that the Shekinah glory of God came into the temple, and the Bible says that the priest could not stand to minister by reason to the presence of God. God is all-powerful, amen, and, and mighty. And, and sometimes we say, Lord, we need a manifestation. Just like we, uh, we sang this morning, we need a move of God, amen. Well, you know what? If you'll get moving, you know, if you'll get moving, God will move with you. God, God doesn't just do things you know, indiscriminately on his own. Sometimes he does, but most time he doesn't. It is that we need to surrender to the divine grace of God, allow his grace to cover our life until it becomes a greater flood than, than all the things that happen around us. You know, I've, I've told this story before, and I'll tell it again. My wife, years and years ago, she worked for the Bosher Bank and Trust, and she worked in the department over in their bookkeeping uh, department was, was not related, directly related, wasn't in the same building uh, as the bank. And there was a lady there that uh, her middle name was Mean. Everybody said, that lady's Mean. And uh, my wife had a struggle with her. And, uh, you know, one day my wife said, you know what, I'm just going to walk in love toward this person. Turns her whole attitude. And she began to teach, treat this woman with such love, and everybody thought, well, you're nuts. But when my wife left... This lady that everybody thought was so mean and terrible gave my wife a present. She said, I got something for you. The love of God and the compassion of God made a difference in her life. She saw a difference in how my wife treated her and how everybody else treated her. Now, you know, there are folks that you get ready for a fight, they'll fight you. But you know, there's no way to retaliate against love. When you, when you love somebody and, and you, when they, you know, they, they sin against you, they trespass against you, and you just heap love on them. They, they don't know how to defend against that. There's no defense against love. God so loved the world. You know, the world's in all this turmoil. All the things that we mentioned and multitudes more are happening in the world all the time. But God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son. Why? Because God had an objective. He said, my house will be full. Now, everybody... You know, the Bible says God's not willing that any perish. It's God not God's will that anybody perish. Anybody go into eternal destruction. Men go there as an apostle. They go there of their own free will and volition because God has said, if you'll receive my son, I'll forgive you of your sins. Simple as that. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us how to be saved. It's not hard. You know, God didn't say, do this, do that, or the other. He says, simply believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Believe God raised him from the dead. Well, you know, some people don't believe that. And because they don't, it, it's a reason they're going to suffer in eternity. Paul closes <clears throat> in, in Galatians 6 and 9. He gives us an encouragement as we wait for a harvest. You know, harvest doesn't happen every day. That's the reason some people get discouraged. But he says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now there's a lot in that scripture. Paul talks about the due season. You know, in the natural, we know if we plant, that, that plant has to germinate, the seed has to germinate, it has to, you know, push up through the ground, and it has to grow to maturity. And uh, eventually it will produce... The harvest that we're looking for, corn takes a while to grow. You know, when it pushes up, it, you know, it looks like Johnson grass. 
and uh, you know it just pushes up and eventually it makes a stalk and then it develops the ears and then top you know have the little little silts it's a little tassel and at a certain point you know that that the corn is ready to pick well you know it takes time for all that to happen it doesn't happen in a moment's time it, it, it is that it happens the same thing is true about prayer and preaching the gospel sometimes we declare the word to people and we think it has no effect on them, but the Word of God is always effective. It's always effective. That's the reason Paul said, one plants, another waters, but it's God that gives the increase. You know, sometimes we're planting, and we're just planting a seed. That somebody else is going to come along, and maybe two or three water that seed, but eventually God is going to bring a harvest. If that person will just listen to the voice of God. You know, and that principle of due season is true. You know, there, I had a friend of mine that owned a, 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 a bunch of land up in Alaska, he had a homestead up there, and uh, the growing season was very short. And uh, he had pictures of, like cabbage, I mean, this thing's just gigantic, that he grew. Why? Because a lot of it's volcanic soil, it's a lot of minerals there, and it does a lot, lot you know, but it's a short growing season, very short time. And it's amazing how quickly things develop there. Well, you know, down south, we have a different growing season. Out west, they have a different growing season. And if you've ever had fruit from out on the west coast, I'll tell you what, it tastes good. I've had some. It doesn't taste like the stuff you get down, you know, at your local grocery store because most of that stuff is shipped green and it ripens on the way and there's a difference. They pick that stuff from the fields that are ripe and, uh, you know, you ever have that kind of fruit, it's, it's simple. The Bible says don't be wearing well done. That simply means you just keep it up. You don't stop. You, you, you're consistent in what you're doing. You know, there is, a, there is something to be said about consistency. If we continually do that, we, we keep reading the Word, we keep giving, then, then it has uh, for us the, uh, the power of God to bring a harvest into our life. The Word goes on to say that we won't, won't faint. You know, that's important, but... That, that we don't quit. Because if you quit, you never have a harvest. If you abandon what you planted, you lose it. You lose everything. If you've been sowing seeds of love, but all of a sudden you just quit, well, it's not getting me any place. I've been, I've been showing this person love, and they just seem to get worse. How I many you know that it gets darker before it gets light? You just work in an oil field, you just work on the rig, and about... 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, it gets dark. Before the dawn, it gets dark. It, it happens on a regular basis. It gets dark. Well, you know, before the dawn of the Word of God, sometimes things get dark. Sometimes when you're believing for healing, you get worse. Because the devil wants to know, do you really believe that or are you just saying that because Brother Moffat or, or somebody else said it? Are you, do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe what God said? Are you willing to stand on the Word of God? If we faint, we lose. So that's why Paul says, you don't faint. You keep on keeping on. You know, the Lord is coming. When's he coming? Well, very soon, I hope. Because we're in, we're in a struggle. We're in a battle uh, that, that we're going to win, good versus evil. But, you know, the book of 2 Thessalonians tells us that he that led us will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, when I was a kid, folks said, well, the Holy Spirit's leaving. No, he's not. But the Holy Spirit is going to change his focus. During the, the time of the Great Tribulation, the Holy Spirit is going to be focused to fulfill the promise that God made to Abraham. And there are going to be 144,000 uh, Jewish men filled with the Holy Ghost. So he that led us, you know what we're holding back? We're holding back the darkness. Even though it seems to ooze in here and ooze in there, we're holding back the man of sin from being revealed and his kingdom. But well, once the church is gone, there's not going to be a lot of deterrent to stop the, the powers of darkness because the Holy Spirit is not going to be dealing with, with, with the church, the Gentile church. He's going to be dealing with the with a Jewish people to, to remind them and let them know that their Messiah has come and he's going to deal and he's going to fulfill his promise to Abraham. And so it's incumbent upon us uh, while it is yet day that we are busy about the Lord's business. That's what Jesus said. As just a little 12-year-old lad, they said, what are you doing? He said, didn't you know I've got to be about my father's business? 
the most important business we ever have on this earth is to, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people everywhere. You rub shoulders with people every day. That, that the power of God's grace and you pray for them. You know, you ought to pray for the people you work for. You, you, ought, to, you ought to pray. You know, the Bible says we're supposed to pray for those in authority over us. And I know sometimes that's hard to pray for folks because we don't agree with what they're doing. But the Bible teaches us that we're to pray for them. Why? Because God is able to change them or to use them to bring glory to His kingdom. I want you to realize that their sin is abounding everywhere. And we could throw up our hands and say, well, it's, what's the use? But the grace of God is greater than anything. The Bible says this, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. That means that the Spirit of God living in you is greater. He's greater than the circumstances you face. He's greater than sickness and disease, and he's greater than the devil. God is greater, and his greatness has been released in you. You're great. You know, sometimes we look at ourselves and say, what, what can I do? I, I'm just an individual. Well, you know, throughout the Bible, God used individuals to do amazing things. You know, if everybody here told their story of their life and the people that they affected, we'd be here for a while. But every one of you has been used by the grace of God to be an influence on the lives of others. You know, number one, our influence ought to be on our, our husband or wife. Then our influence ought to be on our children and our grandchildren. Uh, and then, then our influence should be on those that we work with, that we, we let our light shine. That doesn't mean you carry a coffee table Bible under your arm. Uh, you don't act foolish. But you let the love of Jesus Christ flow out of you because people can see Jesus in your life. Once you stand to your feet, we're going to close this service. So glad that you came today. Glad that the Word of God is working in your life. Our God is faithful. Oh, hallelujah, He is faithful. You know, for those that are joining us by means of the Internet, I, I'm asking you to do this. Uh, and if you haven't received Jesus Christ, it'd be good for you to do this from your heart. The Bible says, If we believe in our heart, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe that God has raised from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The word has to be in two places. It has to be in your heart and in your mouth. So let's pray this. Heavenly Father, I come to you. You know my life. You don't know every sin I have committed. And right now, from my heart, I confess Jesus Christ. With my mouth, I declare, He's my Savior. You raised Him from the dead, and you seat Him at your own right hand. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth. And your word says, I'm saved. Hallelujah. Simple, isn't it? Aren't you glad God didn't make it hard? Amen.